Welcome back to the Environmental Law Monitor. I'm your host, Daniel Pope. This podcast is brought to you by Bracewell LLP's Environment, Lands, and Resources Practice Group, and it's a place for thoughtful conversations on environmental and natural resources law and policy, ranging from the latest developments to perennial topics like litigation, enforcement, and compliance assurance. We're glad you're spending some time with us today. I'm joined today by Taylor Stewart, my colleague and the DC office at Bracewell. Taylor, it's good to see you. And it was nice to be with all the folks from our DC office for our environmental law seminar in Houston. I hope you felt the same way about seeing all of us from Austin. I did. Thanks for having me, Daniel. It was great to see everyone this past week. Um, it's always great to be in our Houston office and to see so many lawyers at the firm. And I think we had some great panels that I'm excited to talk to you about today uh, and to share with your guests. As much as I enjoy our seminar, and I've realized it sort of adds a couple of weeks to my November, December holiday eating problem, because once <laughs> we all get together, we enjoy going out to great restaurants with uh, the practice group and with our clients and, and spending time with them. So I'm going to have to figure out how to manage all of this better and my New Year's resolutions. I thought what we would do today is just spend a little bit of time talking about what we learned and what we appreciated about all the various panels and speakers at the Environmental Law Seminar. And I guess for those of you who are listening to the podcast who maybe haven't heard about our Environmental Law Seminar, our Environment Lands and Resources Group puts on a semi-annual uh, seminar on a variety of environmental and natural resource topics in our Houston office, and we invite our clients. And this year we had a great turnout from people in person, and so that was wonderful to see, but we also had a virtual option for those clients that weren't able to attend in person. So all in all, I thought it was really well attended, and I'm excited to explore some of these topics uh, with you. So one of the first topics, our first kickoff panel involved environmental litigation and developments that we've seen over the past couple of years in APA litigation, permit challenges, enforcement defense, and so forth. And, and that featured Kevin Collins and Jason Hutt, both partners in our practice group, as well as Stephen Cook, who's of counsel. And we are also joined by uh, one of my firm favorites, Steve Benish, who's a litigation partner and sort of litigation wizard in our Austin office. One of the things that I always appreciate learning about from our litigation panels is just the, the latest developments in what's going on, because there it seems to me that there's, there's always so much to keep track of in environmental litigation, whether that's more administrative in nature or that involves citizen suits or government enforcement. I'll ask you, Taylor, for what sort of stood out to you about that panel. I know the things that I always appreciate hearing from the panels and a couple of things that jumped out to me, but I'll let, I'll let you have the mic for a second because I feel like I've been talking too long and, and people are probably tired of me at this point. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll, I'll definitely jump in. So I think the first panel, it, it was really great because I think some of the, the takeaways were that there are trends in on the litigation side that um, are, are really jumping out to, to some of these partners and practitioners that you know our clients really kind of need to keep apprised of. I really liked how Jason kind of uh, spread these out into different what he called different species of environmental litigation, which I, I liked that that little bit of environmental pun. But he you know talked about Title VI becoming a new trend that we're seeing. Um, so Title VI complaints being filed by third parties with uh, federal agencies agencies claiming that um, kind of connecting some of these uh, alleged environmental violations to uh, civil rights act violations. So that's one trend that they were mentioning that they're seeing shareholder derivative suits. That was one that really wasn't on my radar, um, but I, I think that, that that was a really interesting topic that came up in this panel, the the trend that we're seeing in shareholder derivative suits. Yeah, so to jump back, every agency under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act has a, a duty to ensure that all the funds that it's disbursing to state and local recipients don't discriminate with the use of those federal funds. And so the way that this manifests for a lot of our clients and for our regulated entities is that state agencies that have received delegated programs under RICRA or the Clean Air Act to administer portions of federal environmental programs. They have a duty to make sure that they're not discriminating. And, 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 and often they're receiving funds to assist in that delegation, right? And so we're seeing an uptick in complaints lodged at EPA's external civil rights office. And the shareholder suit thing, that also jumped out to me as well. But it'll be really interesting with the environmental, social, and governance trends 
trends or ESG trends we've been tracking, I guess, over the past three years as ESG. But I think most of our ESG presentations have emphasized that this has been going on for a long time under different names. But the point about the shareholder suits is that so many companies have made representations and public facing statements. And it'll be interesting to see if there's a, a significant wave of shareholder litigation when climate or community investment goals aren't actually realized. And that's not something I'd really thought too much about prior to their conversation. Yeah, I hadn't really thought more much about that either. But I think, you know, based on kind of what we were discussing at the seminar and that kind of increased opportunities for uh, shareholders to, to claim maybe that, that the decision makers or the, or the board members in, in a particular company, you know, aren't exercising their due diligence in, in considering some of these environmental concerns or, you know, making certain decisions that maybe the shareholders would like them to make. I hadn't really thought of that as a mechanism by which which you could uh, make certain environmental claims. But I, I think that's definitely one that seemed like a blind spot to me, uh, but that I thought the panel did a great job at, at bringing that out and, and getting it into the discussion. One thing I also thought that the environmental litigation panel did really well was sort of capture a change in emphasis or, or, or maybe really a change in strategy for relatively standard environmental litigation under the Administrative Procedure Act or under the National Environmental Policy Act or, or citizen suit litigation. Obviously, when companies are, are making serious investments and need to obtain permits to move on to the next phase of developing their project, they're eager to get those permits in a timely manner. But one of the things that the litigation panel really emphasized is that you don't want to cut corners when you do that. And while it may be great to receive something on time or ahead of schedule, there are also litigation risks if those permits are challenged and the underlying record does not sufficiently support the agency's issuance of that permit or that authorization, really, whatever you're seeking. And so Stephen Cook and Steve Banish, I thought, also did a great job of emphasizing just how essential it is for companies to be partnering with federal agencies and state agencies where applicable to make sure that issues are addressed in the record so that if your permit actually is challenged, if there is a complaint that the agency issuing the permit was arbitrary and capricious, or if there's a citizen suit, you want to be able to walk into the courtroom with an administrative record that you know is very defensible. And so I always appreciate that. And, and I thought they did a great job of showing just how essential that is and essential it's become over the past five years or so to really pay attention to that in advance of getting your permit. I agree, Daniel. And, and I think Stephen, having Stephen's perspective was really important with him having been both in-house and then at EPA. Some Something that he touched on was, you know, if you're in-house at the company, you know, really get a good, un or, you know, if you're outside counsel, really to get a good understanding of what are the company's commercial priorities? What are trends commercially that you're seeing within the company? What are the most important permits that they need to really prioritize and make sure that those are shored up and that there's a strong administrative record or around those permits? You know, understanding what's most important to the company and then having that lead your legal strategy, I think was a great point that was made by Stephen, having been in kind of in-house, then EPA and now at the firm. Yeah, absolutely. Our next panel we called Power Politics and Policy. And we were lucky enough to have members of our policy resolution group or PRG and break down what actually happened in the midterm elections. And I'm actually kind of nervous to try to summarize <laughs> PRG's comments on the midterms because they know so much about what's going on on the Hill. They're all like masters of 4D or 5D chess and they know all <laughs> the people who uh, who are moving around. And, and so it's always incredible. I'm always kind of blown away by that. And just to, to plug them a little bit more, if you're listening to this podcast, but you're not listening to PRG's Lobby Shop podcast or their Madam Policy podcast, you really should check those out. They actually kind of got the podcast game started at Bracewell and PRG. So we owe a lot to them. They're sort of part of the inspiration here. But I thought that they they, they really broke down the midterms really well and, and highlighted, you know, why there wasn't a red wave, why there was a red ripple, what politics looks like moving forward. And, and so I just thought they did a great job. Yeah, I agree, Daniel. It's always such a pleasure listening to them to really talk about anything, but particularly during big elections, kind of getting their their 
your take on what happened, you know, what, what does it look like going forward is, is really great. And I mean, the crowd at the, the seminar was just captivated by them. I mean, they, they just put on a great show. To, um, but yeah, as, as you said, I mean, I think at a high level, we saw kind of a lack of red wave. So it was a disappointing uh, midterm election cycle for the Republicans. At the time that, that we were at the seminar, they actually hadn't called the House yet, but they have since called the House for the Republicans. Right. And, and we saw as, at the time we're recording this yesterday, uh, Speaker Pelosi, we saw her step down. Um, so she will not continue on to be minority leader. It's expected that mm-hmm. Hakeem Jeffries will, will step into her place and become minority leader and that she will now kind of step aside, um, which is definitely the, the end of an era um, on the Hill. I think anyone that has been remotely interested in politics for the last 30 years knows kind of the, the impact that Pelosi has had. So that'll be, I think, a, a really big change on the Hill and also on the in energy and environmental side. We'll also see a changeover in leadership of the House Energy and Commerce Committee to uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers. Uh, so that will definitely have a, a good amount of impact on the policy side of, of the energy and commerce work that's done on the Hill. It'll be interesting to Scott Siegel, who is uh, one of the co-heads of PRG, made this comment that I thought was really interesting. And it just sort of shows how great their knowledge is for not just what's going on right now in Washington, but what's gone on in the past. Scott made this point that often energy policy is set through a bipartisan Congress. So there have been a number of energy bills that have gone through that have essentially been compromise bills where where divided government has had to come together to address a number of issues. So it'll be interesting if we see something like that happen over the next two years, because as you mentioned, the Republicans have taken back the House, although they're dealing with their own leadership issues right now. Kevin McCarthy's trying to get the votes that are necessary to become the next Speaker of the House. And there are some people who are opposing uh, opposing his leadership, although it's not clear, you know, as, as, as Liam Donovan pointed out, that other people are necessary necessarily going to be clamoring for that job. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens on an energy policy front. And another thing that we talked about briefly, and we are going to be having a, an upcoming podcast on this as well. President Biden has demonstrated an interest in permitting reform that comes out of conversations that he had with West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin related to the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Permitting reform has been something that uh, Joe Manchin has wanted for a while. And, uh, and it looks like uh, President Biden is just as eager to keep up his end of the bargain. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, particularly over this lame duck period. And again, you know, bipartisan government may be coming together to address some of those issues. And we'll have to talk with our PRG friends in short order to check in on how that's going. You know, speaking of permitting reform, we we had a great panel featuring yourself as well as Ann Navarro <laughs> and Kevin Ewing and a couple of our new friends in DC, Catherine Little and Annie Cook on an infrastructure panel, infrastructure really and the public interest and how the public interest and what that has meant as a term is continuing to sort of develop or evolve at a variety of federal agencies. So Taylor, I don't want to step on your toes. You were part of the panel. (laughs) If you could summarize what your panel was talking about in a minute, what would you say? Sure. So it was funny when we were kind of putting this panel together, because I think all of us were seeing a similar trend with our work that a lot of the agencies that we work with or the projects that we work on that are our heavily regulated by particularly federal agencies. Um, We've kind of seen this trend of the agency changing its relationship to its guiding statute or its regulations and and kind of rethinking what does it mean to act in the public's best interest and what does it mean to to carry out our statute in a way that that creates a a better world. And so we've we've kind of seen this trend across all of of the the different projects that we work on. But it was funny all coming together because I don't think we realized how similar some of the issues that we're grappling with are uh, until we all got together and started talking about it for this panel. Uh, so we had, as you said, Annie Cook and Catherine Little, who were discussing their work on the FEMSA side. Should we try, Daniel, to uh, break down the acronym that is FEMSA? It's the Pipeline Hazardous. <laughs> can you Hazardous can you say it? Materials Safety Administration. <laughs> Administration. I think that's right. We should probably keep that in so that people know uh, how difficult it is sometimes to even recall the names of the agencies that <laughs> that you're working under. But we got some great insight. It's definitely alphabet soup sometimes. 
That's right. That's right. We got some great insight from Annie and Catherine on, on some of the trends that they're seeing. So typically, you know, I- increased enforcement, um, so some increased interest in methane monitoring, emission monitoring, changes in the way that, that that agency considers their special permits, seeing something similar, you know, on the core side and with FERC. FERC particularly, you know, enforces the Natural Gas Act and approves natural gas infrastructure, both pipelines um, and related infrastructure. And we've seen that agency, you know, really rethink, you know, what does it mean to grant a pipeline that's in the public interest? In the past, um, FERC has considered its public interest obligation uh, as something they considered economically, what, whether this was in the public's best interest and whether there was a real need for the gas and, and a need for the resource. But now we're kind of seeing them change that perspective and say, let's balance uh, the importance of, of the need for this resource with the importance of protecting our environment and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this is, you know, this is a framework that that the agency really hasn't used in the past. So they're kind of crafting it every day and changing their perspective. And for me, you know, we're also seeing it on the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management side or BOEM. Um, BOEM is the federal agency that permits uh, offshore wind projects on the Outer Continental Shelf. They have, have in recent years really tried to make changes to their leasing program that are very different from what's called for in Oxla, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. That is the agency's guiding statute. And when it leases for oil and gas offshore leasing, uh, there's kind of a, a five-year plan. Um, most of the considerations are, you know, prevention of waste, making sure there's a fair return for the U.S. Treasury, things like that. Um, but on the offshore wind side, we're really seeing BOEM try to take into consideration, you know, how will this impact the environment? How will this impact onshore communities? even though that's really not something that's that's contemplated much by the agency statute. Uh, so we're seeing a huge amount of capital right now being injected into the offshore wind industry. Um, the the leases in, in February of this year, went the highest one went for $1.1 billion. So it's a ton of money going to that industry and BOEM is exploring, you know, what does it mean for us to lease these and how can we ensure that some of this capital goes back to the communities and to the environment that, that are impacted by the development of the project. Um, so I, th- I think all of us are seeing, you know, similar trends with, with these agencies in the way that they're permitting, um, exercising enforcement authority, exercising their leasing authority, and just similar trends to, to really consider the public interest impacts on the environment and try to, to mold their statutory authority to, to something that creates, you know, what they see as maybe a better planet. Well, and that kind of goes with one of the things that we saw pretty early on from this administration, which is that addressing climate change and and addressing environmental justice and the legacy of sort of disproportionate environmental impacts being borne by minority communities and other, other you know, sort of low income communities, that, that was a whole of government approach. And I think one takeaway from your panel was that you know, the agencies, a variety of agencies have sort of heeded that call to, to address those various issues. And I think one of the things that y'all explore on your panel was that, okay, well, uh, there are social goals here. There are climate goals here that this administration is concerned about. And it's reasonable for the administration to be concerned about climate change and uh, the legacy of uh, disproportionate environmental impacts. The question that I think you grappled with uh, and and you've sort of talked about here is, that okay, so with those goals, where do you locate them in, in the statute, right? And so some statutes have just maybe a phrase like the public interest. Other statutes like the National Environmental Policy Act may have a lot of, of purposeful language talking about the importance of environmental protections and considering impacts on the environment. And so that that will be, uh, that's something I'm very interested to see over the next couple of years as those policies or decisions are challenged and upheld or remanded or tweaked. It'll be really interesting to see where climate change concerns find a home, where environmental justice concerns find a home in the statutes that we're talking about. Um, and and speaking of environmental justice, we were privileged to have Dr. Tame Shake from EPA's Region 6 to talk with Whit Swift. They had a great conversation in Dallas that they live streamed down to us. And I think what we heard from Dr. Shake was was pretty consistent with what we've been seeing from environmental justice, that it's it's not located in any one initiative at EPA or even at a region office at EPA, but it's really an approach that affects and informs a variety of different 
different divisions within EPA. One thing that I appreciated from his remarks towards us was just the the importance of trying to understand your communities around your project areas or where you have existing facilities or infrastructure, really doing the diligence and getting out and meeting people and finding out what their concerns are. And then other sort of best managed, what he called sort of best practices of, of making sure that, you know, the first time that a community hears about your engagement is not just a posting in a newsletter somewhere, but that your company is really a presence in that community and getting to know people. Yeah, I had similar takeaways, Daniel. I, I think it was great for him to kind of touch on best management practices, you know, uh, getting to know the communities at your fence line, walking that fence line, engaging with them on a regular basis and, and you know, voluntarily adopting maybe some of these monitoring measures that that EPA would otherwise maybe involuntary for un, involuntarily force on the industry um, and, and asking industry to to take their being a good neighbor more seriously, I think was was kind of the takeaway of his remarks. And we also had to close out our session, um, a nice cocktail hour slash lightning round where we had, I think, four different presentations and we don't have time to jump into them all here, but we had a lightning round on hydrogen, which I thought was fascinating and the development of the hydrogen economy, the development of hydrogen hubs and initiatives to include hydrogen as a natural gas under the Natural Gas Act. That stuff was fascinating to hear about. We also had Brittany Pemberton shared some of her initial observations on the on the new proposed methane rule and the ink was still wet, right? On a 500 page document. So that came out like <laughs> the night before we all traveled to Houston and we are all still digesting that. Um, and I know you've spent some time with it too, Taylor, uh, over the past week or so. What is, you know, what's your top bullet point about the proposed methane rule? Sure. I, the ink was still wet. I think Brittany did a great job at, at hitting it at a high level. I probably won't do as, as great of a job here, but I'll just say that a lot of the industry saw last November. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll give myself more credit. Um, the industry saw last November EPA put out uh, a proposed rule on um, decreasing methane emissions, and the idea of that proposal was to to require certain methane emission monitoring efforts at different types of sources, so particularly pipelines or or well sites. And at the time, EPA put kind of a limit on okay, if, if this source emits less than three tons per year, then we we won't require much monitoring on that source. Um, and it also provided an, an opportunity for operators to use advanced detection technologies. So rather than um, optical gas imaging, which is the typical technology used, they opened up kind of the, this opportunity to use advanced technology. In the day before the seminar, I think they submitted a, a supplemental proposal, which was just a supplement to the one that they issued a year ago, which uh, w- was similar, um, but definitely, definitely some significant changes. Both most importantly, I'd say the fact that there is no longer kind of a, a minimum threshold of emissions for, for some of the monitoring efforts. Um, EPA backtracked on that and decided that um, even emission sources under three tons per year uh, could use some of those those monitoring measures. And they also kind of introduced better a better framework for the use of advanced technology. So they set up kind of a, a new system by which an operator can, can attempt to use a, a certain technology that they think would be effective for monitoring their kind of source. So I I think that will be definitely one to watch as we wade through the 500 pages. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I think too, the methane rule is so big, I would be surprised if our practice group didn't put out something to help break it down, whether that's that's a client (laughs) alert or um, a webinar. So if you have not signed up for those notifications and you are a client, please do visit our website, bracewell.com. Scroll down to, I think it's a a button that says stay connected, you'll be able to sign up for all of our environmental alerts. Um, we also had brief lightning rounds on carbon capture and where we are on on moving forward with class six wells. We have also had a more general EPA region six update. If any of the topics that we've discussed here are things that you're interested in and you weren't able to attend the seminar, I know that we are glad to do lunch and learns and to visit with you and your team to make sure that you're able to, to get that information Uh, But for now, for Taylor, for me, and for the rest of the podcast team, thank you for spending a little time with us this afternoon. We hope you travel safely during the holidays and we will talk to you soon. That's it for us today at the Environmental Law Monitor. 
Big thanks to our guests, as well as Dorn, Julia, and Emily, and the rest of our production team who helped to make our podcast possible. And of course, you, our listeners. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.